so um, just as a reminder, so we got we had Stephen uh, Gordon uh, right here, and the fellows just put uh, all the updates, which we're gonna send to you all via PDF. We're gonna, and they have prepared. Everybody heard the presentation from Dr. Janice. We are going to have our next two speakers, which is Dr. Peterson, and Dr. Fox. But they've been really, really looking into opportunities. Uh, how do we best use new technologies into diseases that are quite complex? One of them in the brain is arterial venous malformation and this Aruba era and the role of radio surgery. So they divided forces, uh, both Dr. Fox is one of our consultants, associate professor, everybody knows who he is, uh, Michigan, uh, stay there in Michigan for all the way from medical school residency, play actually hockey there, won two NCAA championships, went to play professionally, then went to play into the military, and then uh, eventually going back to residency and doing amazing things. Uh, Dr. Peterson, the only thing that I can tell you is when I first came here, I thought that she was on 24 seven and she was on 24 seven as the only radiation oncologist we were picking up and uh, never, never had any issues getting my patients continued to never have any issues. She's an amazing colleague, extraordinarily accomplished as well. Recently promoted to associate professor. Soon I hope promoted to full professor. She is a tremendous uh, teacher, and an incredible clinician, caring, smart in so many different ways, just a tremendous colleague. And I know she, uh, Dr. Trifoletti and, uh, and, and Dr. Fox, they all have a tremendous relationship and a great working relationship professionally and in so many different ways. So we're excited to have the two of you. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this right here. Uh, and uh, uh, take it away, Chris and Jennifer, please. Great, thank you so much, Q. Dr. Gordon, that was a great first talk. And uh, thanks everyone for continuing uh, to listen uh, after a couple of talks. So. Um, let me just share my screen. All right, can everybody see that okay? Awesome. Yeah, we're good. All right, well, uh, what we're gonna talk this morning is uh, Dr. Q mentioned about uh, gamma knife stereotactic radio surgery for brain AVMs in the Aruba era, uh, since things have changed somewhat uh, after Aruba, just in terms of uh, perception and uh, perhaps um, whether or not the traditional treatment of AVMs has, has uh, you know, should continue um, in the same manner. So um, I have no disclosures. And what I'm gonna do is try to set the stage a little bit and talk some about the traditional um, uh, treatment of AVMs and how we've managed these uh, in the past, um, and then put a little bit of context into the discussion um, regarding uh, Aruba and some of the disparate data that's available in the literature. And then I will uh, pass it off to Dr. Peterson to get a little bit more into the details uh, and take a deep dive into uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, gamma knife uh, for these lesions now. So um, I'm gonna skip the first case, but let's go to the second case. I just wanted to I get some opinions on this and, and sort of pull the group here as to what they would do. This is a 30 year old security guard with seizures and mild left sided weakness and discoordination. He was found to have a Spetzer Martin three right from a bridal AVM, two for size and one for eloquence. Here's the angiogram showing the size and the location. Uh, and uh, Gaetano, if you could do poll number two here, I'm just curious what the audience uh, would do. Treat medically, in other words, control seizures, embolize and resect surgically, embolize uh, partial or complete alone, embolization plus radio surgery or stereotactic radio surgery alone. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, there's no right or wrong answer. So just to get sort of a consensus about what folks would recommend here, if you wouldn't mind just uh, Checking one of these boxes. And I am your poll master. I'm oh, excellent. I, I'm looking at the poll right now. Numbers are flying. This is the first time that Gaetano, apparently he couldn't control it. So, because. Uh, yeah, these are always microphone. a little, based on who's the host, it's always a little difficult. Yes. So it's cool. So I'm looking at the numbers fly in and they're still flying numbers. And then when I end the poll, I think Gaetano tells me that we're going to be able to see this. I still see numbers. 
we'll give it a uh, yeah. Uh, this, this is exciting. I think this is the first time actually one of these polls has worked for me. So. All righty. I see still some changes right here. We have a lot of people signing. I think that, uh, let me go ahead and I think we have enough numbers to get a sense. Let me dump the poll right here and then share results. Here we go. Can you see that? All right, wow, 35% embolization plus surgical resection and 39% embolization plus stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, excellent. That That right. is uh, exactly why I wanted to do a poll. We're going to have one more case and one more poll, but you can see there's a huge variety of response, and each one of these responses would have uh, plenty of controversy in its own right and could potentially be an hour talk just about um, you know, these responses individually. So great. So I'm going to close I'm gonna that. Stop sharing. Yeah, there you go. Okay, perfect. We're going to do one more case here and do the same thing. So this is a 21 year old college student with memory and cognitive complaints, previously um, an A student throughout high school and early college, and then started having difficulty um, in lectures and started getting Bs and Cs with no other um, issues. Uh, she was diagnosed with a Spetzel Martin II left temporal AVM. And uh, here's the angiogram. So just in the interest of time, we'll go to the poll. So this is poll number three. Poll number three. I, I surgical to... management, embolization plus surgical resection, surgical resection, embolization plus SRS or SRS alone. Same idea as before. Gaetano is uh, telling me that he can retire now, and I said, absolutely not. <laughs> this is the easy part of, of doing these three polls that are all set up. This is, I see the numbers flying in, Chris. Awesome. Gaetano, thanks for uh, making this work. Appreciate it. And of course, thank you to the poll master. Yes. And that reminds me, Chris, a lot of these polls is quite interesting because this is all, by the way, it's all data that we collect. That is also publishable. Yes. Yeah. I think that we have a good number. I'm gonna end up the poll right now. We have good numbers right now. I see a couple yeah. offline. I'm gonna end the poll and then I'm gonna share the results. Here we go. Okay, again, embolization plus surgical resection. I guess we we have identified that this is a neurosurgical grand round. So uh, we show our biases here with uh, embolization, surgical resection being number one, radio surgery being number two. All right, excellent. Well, we're going to, um, I think we can move on here, Q. Thank you. Right. We're going to talk about these cases a little bit later. And uh, this just brings me to the some of the beginning points of this talk is that management of unruptured brain AVMs is controversial. No definitive treatment strategy has been identified. And then most treatment decisions are made at the institutional level. Um, so that's um, you know, led to even more controversy, I think, trying to solve some of these questions. And we'll get into that um, as, we, as we go along. So just to give a little historical background, um, the Andra paper uh, from 1990 was um, really the first, uh, you know, one of the first big studies of the natural history of AVMs. And this is often quoted when we're talking uh, to patients about rupture risk. This was 160 patients followed in Finland over 23 years just after World War II. Uh, the yearly bleeding rate was 4%. Mortality in this series was 1% from hemorrhage from the AVM. None of these patients were treated. Combined major morbidity and mortality was 2.7% per year. Um, and the vast majority of these patients, 71% presented with hemorrhage, but what is uh, frequently sometimes missed when, when folks I think are talking about this study is that um, these were all patients who had presented with symptomatic AVMs. Remember, this was in the 1940s to 1970s, pre-CT scan, pre-MRI. So these are patients who presented either with hemorrhage or seizure and underwent an angiogram and had uh, a diagnosis of an AVM. So this is not really a natural history study of all patients with AVMs. It's an evaluation of re-bleed risk. Um, and, and so perhaps quoting this page paper or citing this paper when we're talking to patients may not be um, the most accurate in terms of natural history. Nonetheless, that, that's been the basis for a long time uh, in terms of, uh, you know, 
all of us who treat AVMs uh, uh, citing this paper. Uh, if you look at things like Greenberg, which every neurosurgery resident uh, carries around uh, religiously during training, um, you know, much of what is published out there comes from this. And if you look at rupture risk for somebody who's my age, 45, if you assume a 2% annual risk, lifetime rupture risk of an AVM is 50%. So even using smaller risk percentages than what's in the Andra paper, um, pretends a relatively high risk of uh, rupture for patients, which is um, what has led us to treat these lesions up front. And that's also been um, reproduced in more recent studies. Um, <clears throat> Rose Dew, who just recently gave a talk, uh, this is a meta-analysis she published in 2013, looking at annual ICH risk in unruptured patients, 2.2%. So, so these are all good ballpark numbers talking about the, uh, the risk of AVMs rupturing. But nonetheless, there, there is a huge amount of disparate data out there. You know, you'll read things about, oh, you can, you can estimate lifetime risk of AVM bleeding by subtracting age from 105. Here's the Andra paper. There are some higher risk features. Uh, There's another recent speaker, Dr. Judy Wong, um, with a new scoring system here, looking at other variables that can increase the risk. And so as you go through the literature, you can find lots of examples that, that do point to a, a high longitudinal risk for AVM rupture. For example, um, Dr. Wong's red AVM score, depending on how many risk factors you have, your uh, lifetime uh, probability of hemorrhage you know, could be as high as 70 or, or 80%. So, so these are certainly uh, potentially dangerous lesions. And I think the, the, the point of all this is that we still have work to do to figure out which lesions are at the highest risk of rupture. So that's kind of a little bit of the background as to what led to the Aruba study. And this was a paper from the Aruba group introducing the study. Um, and just by the title, you can sort of understand why much of this has been very controversial. Here's the title, Invasive Treatment of Unruptured Brain Arteriovenous Malformations is Experimental Therapy. So, um, you know, a pretty provocative title. And if you look through this paper, um, and this is from 15 years ago, just before Aruba recruitment started, um, the claim was made that the five-year rupture risk of an AVM is about five to 20%, and the five-year cumulative treatment risk based on which series you look at is also about five to 20%. And even, you know, even if those numbers are, are taken as gospel, the issue with this is the fact that you know, if you're 20 or 45 or 60, your life expectancy is a lot more than five years. And that's the problem. So one of the pieces of literature that was used um, to justify this paper was the Columbia AVM data database showing significant declines in neurologic function after surgery. Unfortunately, however, this data is, is not um, modern surgical series data and does not accurately reflect the treatment of AVMs currently. So uh, again, much controversy about this right off the bat. So uh, Aruba and then the follow-up Aruba paper, um, these were published in 2014 and 2020 respectively. And basically what this was is a randomization over six years of 114 patients to interventional therapy, which could have been any type of AVM treatment, including embolization surgery or radiosurgery, and then 109 patients to medical management. Most of these were Spetzler Martin II or less, um, although there were a few higher grade lesions included. Uh, the randomization was halted uh, due to superiority of uh, medical management after uh, mean follow up of 33 months. And what was found um, over this short follow-up time uh, was that the interventional arm had a higher risk of stroke or death over 30% versus the medical arm, 10%. And obviously a few problems with this right off the bat, um, one of them being a very short follow-up period for a, a disease that affects patients lifelong. And then one of the other issues is that um, the intervention type, this was a primarily um, embolization uh, driven study. Um, very few patients underwent neurosurgery alone or even neurosurgery plus embolization. So there's been a fairly significant uh, pushback against uh, Aruba. Uh, this is a, a review and editorial uh, by Dr. Wong uh, looking at some of the um, issues 
uh, with this, including small percentage of low-grade AVMs treated with microsurgery, short follow-up period of 33 months, um, a very inclusive definition of stroke that may have um, artificially inflated the, uh, the, the risk of intervention, um, and so on and so forth. There's also been a number of series that have um, compared uh, their Aruba-like patients to the actual Aruba trials. This is um, uh, from the Harvard group. Uh, looking at 318 patients with AVMs treated with any of the uh, typical interventions, so similar um, inclusion criteria to Aruba, and then they performed a specific analysis on 142 Aruba eligible patients. The annualized stroke rate for this cohort was 1.8%. Um, the primary Aruba endpoint of symptomatic stroke was 9.2%, which matched the medical arm in Aruba and was much less, about a third, than the interventional arm. Looking at a secondary Aruba endpoint of um, uh, modified Rankin greater than or equal than, than two at five years, this was uh, reached in 14.3% of patients in this series which was much less than the 40% in the Aruba intervention arm and actually less as well than the medical arm uh, in Aruba. This led to uh, the AHA ASA scientific statement uh, that came out um, a couple of years ago. Um, again, uh, voicing concerns about Aruba that the, the primary endpoints reported for Spetzelmartin grade one, two, or three AVMs were much, much higher in terms of uh, poor outcome than what would be expected in a contemporary series. If you look at previous meta-analysis of grade one, two, and three AVMs, these, the numbers of uh, percentage of poor outcomes is much, much less, 4% versus 14%, 10% versus 43%, 18% versus 57% than what was reported in Aruba. There's also other reasons that we treat AVMs than uh, just um, hemorrhage risk, and that includes uh, Things like uh, cognitive performance, such as uh, in the second patient we discussed at the beginning. This was a study recently published in the White Journal looking at 70 patients with um, a history of AVM who underwent specific neurocognitive testing. More than 70% of these patients had neurocognitive deficits and temporal lobe AVMs were more likely to result in memory deficits on neurocognitive testing. So again, this is similar to the, the case that was presented here earlier. Specifically about radio surgery, just as a primer before I pass it on to Dr. Peterson, um, there's been a few um, large analyses uh, of both pre-Aruba type um, treatment options uh, using radio surgery and post-Aruba um, uh, series looking at this. So this is, um, this is one that um, uh, reported patients in the pre-Aruba era um, looking at uh, 172 patients treated with first-line uh, gamma knife uh, SRS median age of 40, uh, almost nine years of follow-up. Um, overall obliteration rate was 76% in this series. Post-treatment hemorrhage risk was about 1.1% uh, per year, which is less than the medical arm uh, of Aruba, which was 2.2% annual risk of hemorrhage in patients who were treated conservatively. Very low um, uh, post-gamma knife morbidity, so transient uh, problems in 8%, permanent neurological deficits in less than 5%, 86% of patients with an MRS less than or equal to one at last follow-up. And another benefit here, about 85% of patients who presented with pre-therapeutic uh, epilepsy were seizure-free after radio surgery. And one of the last studies here I'll, I'll talk about is, um, uh, this is a post-Aruba um, analysis recently published in the Red Journal, looking at um, uh, results after gamma knife serotactic radio surgery compared to the medical arm of Aruba. And what you'll see is for the first five years or so, taking all comers in this series who were treated with gamma knife, very close to the medical arm uh, in Aruba. However, after five years, the risk of hemorrhage in the Aruba group continues going up whereas this flattens out. And Jennifer's gonna talk a little bit more about this specifically. Also looking at um, hemorrhagic mortality rates. Again, there's a steady mortality rate in patients who are untreated versus those who are treated with gamma knife uh, radio surgery. That, that risk is much, much less. So uh, again, management of unruptured AVMs remains controversial. I think uh, the multidisciplinary approach, such as what we have here with uh, our complex comprehensive uh, uh, vascular conference and multiple people from multiple disciplines working together is 
the best way to approach these complex lesions. We, of course, have to balance necessary. Uh, we have to balance um, uh, risk of treatment uh, with the longitudinal benefit, considering life expectancy. Um, there's multiple options for treating these patients, including conservative management, surgery, embolization, radiosurgery, or combinations of the above. Um, and high rates of uh, ABM obliteration and seizure control can certainly be achieved using gamma knife stereotactic radiosurgery in carefully selected patients. And this is supported by analysis um, in both pre and post Aruba patient cohorts. So that's 